Thank you, Crystal. Should we make a change in something that is established? There is something that exists currently. Should we change it? Now let me ask you, should we innovate? The definition of innovate is to make a change in something that has been established. So both questions are identical. Should we innovate and should we make a change in something established are asking the exact same thing. Yet one leads to many follow-up questions such as, what is the change? Will it make things better or worse? And the other leads to a quick and universal, yes, of course, of course we should innovate. Why is this? The answer is that we have collectively added a positive linguistic connotation to the word innovate, so much so that it now has further meaning for us when we hear it, in addition to just its definition. When we hear innovate, we assume immediately that it will bring forth a positive change. We assume that it will make that which has been established infinitely better. But the word makes no such promise. The word still only means that if you innovate, you will change something that has been established. So we cannot just seek to innovate. It is not enough to just change something. It is not enough then to just innovate. Innovation must be thoughtful. It must be deliberate. And it must be difficult. For in order for great and worthwhile innovation, one must exert exponentially more effort than just putting the word innovate on a poster or a company mission statement. First, there must be a prerequisite to know intimately what is currently established. Second, one must understand fully what is desirable and undesirable about the current environment. Third, one must seek to eliminate that which is not wanted while enhance that which is. And fourth, one must tirelessly strive to bring that reality into existence. No one knew this more than my grandmother. She grew up visiting her aunt's cottage every summer in the 1930s in a small beach village in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. She purchased that cottage from her aunt in the 1960s because she wanted to give this same magical summer experience to her daughter. And I was fortunate enough that some years later, her daughter wished to give that experience to me. And so when I was a little boy, each year we would drive through the village to open up our cottage for the summer. And we would see one or two houses either being completely torn down or renovated. Typically this occurred when a lifelong resident passed away and a new wealthy family purchased the beachfront property, seeking to transform the cottage into a modern, luxurious home. And my grandmother would tell me in her Boston accent, you know, they're working on that one down there on the corner hall. It used to be a real nice cottage there. And I hope this new one goes. I hope it goes. And I would say, what do you mean goes? It looks like it's going to be a big, beautiful house. It has central air conditioning and heat and beautiful deck. And she'd say, well, I know, I know, I know, Paul. It has all those things. But, you know, does it go? You see, it has to go with the others. It has to fit in the neighborhood or else it's gonna stick out like a sore thumb and no matter how many nice things it has, I wouldn't buy that place for a nickel. When I was a little boy, I thought she was resistant to change, that she didn't like new things. That she wanted to keep everything just as it was. But that wasn't true at all. She was just expressing that there is a difference between a change for something new and a change for something better. My grandmother met every prerequisite to being able to speak about which innovations are worthwhile in that village. She knew intimately what had been established for decades. She knew what made it wonderful and what made it not ideal. And she thought that each change that happened in that town enhanced what made it wonderful. And she was willing to put in the work to make that happen. In fact, our original cottage still stands. It has a washer and dryer now and a dishwasher and heat for the winter. Surely it was innovated upon since 1930, but that which was wondrous was not altered. Small beach towns in healthcare have one thing in common. There is an intangible magic happening within them. And people either recognize this magic, like my grandmother, and do their best to cherish it and to cultivate it, or they don't. Either way, the magic remains because it is so deeply embedded into the fabric of the entity 
that it cannot be altered. Rather, each change that happens in the environment, each innovation merely enhances or draws away focus from that magic. But the magic remains no matter what. I know my grandmother did her best to explain it to me. It is difficult to put into words what makes a small beach town in Cape Cod magical because it is found in so many things. It could be the breeze carrying the summer ocean through the air. It could be the orange tinge of the sun setting over the bay, or it could just be the feeling of a loving family gathering to spend time together in the sun. But the magic of healthcare is not hard to explain at all. It is found in two people, the patient and the provider. There is a human being who needs to be cared for, and there is another human being caring for them. This is the only essential requirement to having health care. In fact, everything else could go away, and as long as there is one person taking care of the health of another person, there is health care. So I often ask myself if my grandmother was looking at health care technology, like she looked at her village in Cape Cod, would she think that it goes? I don't know. Since the implementation of the electronic health record, health care has become more and more about data collection leaving the unquantifiable human connection to noble clinicians who seek to preserve it. The clinician is then pulled away from the patient to chart, perform manual audits, submit data to external agencies to fulfill billing and government requirements, all with a primary goal to ensure that required documentation is complete. And so the healthcare industry is left with an ever-widening technology gap that increasingly demands robust analytics yet still requires clinicians and patients to manually fuel the data engine. Also, much like my hometown, we have a growing number of people, companies, and government officials, building things in healthcare who aren't as wise as my grandmother. They didn't take the time to know the town. They don't know what makes it special. Some of them have never even walked through for a visit, but they innovate and start building anyway. They bring new electronic health records. They promise AI and big data. They bring machine learning and digital health. And it is all potentially wonderful. But if these things are built into a village of healthcare without being intricately woven into that which makes the village wondrous, they're useless. In fact, they are not only useless, in the words of my grandmother, they stick out like a sore thumb because they detract focus away from the beauty that surrounds them. I truly believe there is a world on the horizon where technology does not oppose, but aids us in our efforts to refocus on that which makes healthcare wondrous. There is a future where the provider is not torn between charting and caring, and the patient is able to both recover while being simultaneously restored. I was fortunate enough to be part of a group of nurses who invented a technology forged by this ethos. We partnered with some of the world's leading engineers, founded a company called Inspirant, and created Augie. Augie stands for Augmented Intelligence, because we believe that Inspirant, that all technology in healthcare should not replace, but augment the human interaction. So we worked to build a wall-mounted hybrid sensing device that aggregates both real-time and historic data from the physical and digital environment using computer vision and Bluetooth low energy. We then took that data and made predictive algorithms through the synthesis of that information to reduce medical errors and prevent never events such as falls and pressure injuries. In doing so, not only data aggregation, but data capture. Data capture at the point of care becomes truly automated with the burden of charting lifted from the clinician, allowing them to spend more time with patients. Inspiring's gamification platform then rewards these caring actions to bring this optimal state full circle. Inspire and Inagi have received over 20 awards for innovation and design from organizations such as Time Magazine, Edison Awards, and South by Southwest. Our team was even honored to receive the inaugural Nurse-Led Innovation Award from the American Nurses Association in 2019. And while full credit goes to our team of engineers who created these novel algorithms using the fusion of computer vision and Bluetooth low energy, for the first time in the patient environment. What is most remarkable about Inspiring is that a group of nurses and technologists work together to seek to create a reality where the interactions between clinicians and patient are paramount 
with technology simply augmenting this interaction. Arguably more groundbreaking than the technology itself is the introduction of a new innovation paradigm, a blueprint for how optimal innovation can occur in healthcare, a blueprint where people who live and breathe the positive and negative aspects of healthcare every day step up and truly lead, not for money, not for stockholders or a promotion, but because they want to make it better. And they are supported by people gifted in other domains, such as technology and business, who recognize that they do not live and breathe that environment every day, but they wish to do all they can to make that environment better too. This blueprint is the only way to seize the future of healthcare. Innovation at the bedside. If we truly want this world to exist, we must create it, for we cannot get there in the current paradigm. So if you wish to innovate, as I truly hope you do, or if you're ever just presented with the innovation of another and are considering whether or not to use it, ask these questions. One, what did you do to know the space you are innovating in more intimately? Two, what was optimal and not optimal about the space before your solution? And three, what is enhanced and eliminated after your solution is brought into existence? If these questions are not answered acceptably, there was not enough effort. The innovation likely resembles a house built in the village of which my grandmother would not approve. But if those questions are answered appropriately, if the time and the effort was placed for those questions to receive an acceptable answer, then the innovation likely leads to a more wondrous reality, worthy of being cherished. I drove home three summers ago to my family cottage. And when I walked in, I looked in the dining room where for over 90 years there had been a table by the window, a dining room table where food, laughter, and love were shared. But on this day, there was a bed, a bed in place of the table. You see, the furniture was changed. Before I arrived, my mother innovated. She changed something that was established. She had chosen to bring my 91-year-old grandmother out of the hospital and home with hospice. My mother knew the space intimately. She knew the person in that space. She did not think that being in the hospital anymore was optimal. And so she worked tirelessly to innovate and make a new reality optimal. Like with any great innovation, what was worth preserving before still remained in that dining room. The breeze still blew through the window. The sun set one more time over the bay and a family gathered in the same space to express their love for each other. I know my grandmother approved. I hope we can say the same about every piece of innovation that comes into healthcare. Thank you to Hams and the American Nurse Association for this opportunity. And thank you all very much for your time listening and for striving to make healthcare truly 